Uh, the main topic today is Jesus is the cornerstone. And so many of us are not builders in the old school tradition. We'll have to talk about this a little bit, but Jesus is the cornerstone is our main topic. It comes from two verses in the uh, beginning scriptures, one from Psalms and one from Isaiah, that are both on the same topic and they get kind of mashed up together, even though they were written quite a bit of time apart, but they get mashed together in the New Testament and quoted very frequently. All the Gospels, uh, 1 Peter, Acts, Romans, other places in the New Testament, quote these two verses, um, sometimes together, sometimes individually. So we'll start by looking at the first one, Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So uh, this is one of the verses that gets quoted a lot in the New Testament. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So a couple things about it. Um, one is that it is the builders who are rejecting it. So it is the experts, uh, the people who look around to try and find what would be the best stones to build with and are the professionals, they've done this a long time, they know uh, what makes a good material. What... Let me use an illustration that uh, is just way far away from building. I used to edit uh, Super 8 movies. They're extraordinarily small. The film is extraordinarily small. And most people looking at it can hardly see the frames in it. Each frame, there's uh, about 18 frames a second form the motion, but each one of those little bits is a one, one slice of a second, so an 18th of a second. And in those uh, m maybe a quarter inch wide frames, when you're editing them, eventually, you know, at first you might not even be able to see the image. But if you get practiced at it where you can see the image, eventually you can see the three layers. The yellow layer, the red layer, the blue layer that are forming the composite image. Eventually your eyes become so attuned to this little tiny object that you're able to see the depth of it even though the depth is, is bigger than a micron but it's quite small. When you're good at something, accomplished, have lots of practice, you're able to distinguish at that level, that level of minutia that most people will never see. They, they won't notice the 18th of a second. They might not notice a second of the film. But you're able to see layers that people never can see. So that's why director's cuts after the fact often are very different because the director's had some time to try and do the things that he or she would have liked to have done but ran out of time. When you're an expert, you're able to see things that others can't. Psalm 118 says something curious. The experts who are really good at noticing the tiniest details have seen something that is huge. And they have rejected it saying it's not worth it. But what they have rejected became the chief cornerstone. So the people who should know the best have looked at a stone and said, that's not good for anything. All right, so a couple things about this. It's the cornerstone. If you're going to build a building, this is the one that you lay down first and align everything to. It's uh, today when we talk about a cornerstone, it's often not even a stone. It's just cement that has the name of the building date. The, uh, but that's not what a cornerstone is something solid and everything gets aligned to it. So if you've got a crooked cornerstone, you're going to have a crooked building because it, everything is built off of it. The stone the builders rejected became the cornerstone and not just any cornerstone, it became the chief one. So among all the buildings, this is the one that matters. And the builders, when they first saw this, said, yeah, that doesn't have any value. There are people today who are looking at Jesus, not recognizing that Jesus has any value. 
and uh, Psalms and Isaiah and all the New Testament passages that quote these two locations say Jesus is that stone. Jesus is the cornerstone around whom the world should be aligning, around whom justice aligns and righteousness, and, and it is good when we, First Peter says, when we align ourselves like living stones with Jesus. All right, so that's the psalm. The other reference that gets picked up in the New Testament and quoted that's on the same theme that gets quoted with the Psalm 118 is from Isaiah 28. So Isaiah 28 says, I am laying, this is God saying, I am laying in Zion a foundation stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone. So you see the resonance between the two passages. Uh, it's talking about a cornerstone. God says, I'm laying in Zion a cornerstone. It's a sure foundation and one who trusts will not panic. So uh, if you're ever becoming anxious, it's good to remember you can trust in the cornerstone and not panic because there is something in your life that is trustworthy even though uh, you might be in what feels like an earthquake and the ground might feel very unsettled, but Jesus as the cornerstone is a sure foundation. You'd have no need to panic. And God says, I will make justice the line and righteousness the plummet. And righteousness is the plumb line. So some of you have seen a, a weight um, on a string that you hold and it is able to tell you the, um, where exactly is right below whatever you're measuring. That plumb line, God says, is righteousness. So the cornerstone, which the New Testament is going to say is Jesus. When we align our, life, our lives with Jesus, we're aligning our lives with someone who knows what justice is and who knows what righteousness is. And along the way, uh, many people have tried for a righteousness. So a couple of weeks ago, we looked at Romans saying that there are some people who have spent their lives striving for righteousness and missed out even though they worked and worked and worked. And in their community, they were, people would say, well, this is the best there is. But God looked on their lives and said, no, that's not the best because they're striving for the wrong thing. They're trying to do it by their works, which is a tricky thing to say because your works do matter. But if you put your confidence in your works, that's not good. They're, tr they're striving by works, God says, Paul says in Romans, if they'd have striven by faith, that's how we got righteous, because we accepted the righteousness given us by Jesus, by God's mercy. And we got something um, for free to us. We got something for free that others spent decades trying to achieve through the wrong means. Uh, it's a tricky message because if someone says, oh, okay, I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ and then goes and sits on the couch, that's not the optimum life. So works matter, but works aren't what get you what is most important. Matthew 21, starting in verse 42. Jesus quotes uh, uh, this passage, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So the, the builders looked at the corners, what should have been the one that they would align themselves to and said, yeah, that's not worth it. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it's amazing in our eyes. So Jesus quotes uh, Psalm 118 and then says, therefore I tell you the kingdom of God will be taken away from you. So that Jesus was talking to a group of people who believed that the kingdom of God was their birthright. And Jesus says, well, because of how you've lived your lives, God's kingdom is being taken away from you. And it's gonna be given to a people that produce the fruit of the kingdom. So people who are striving by their works and trying to earn their salvation, trying to earn their goodness, trying to earn their righteousness, can have lives that other people admire, but in God's sight, they've missed out. What 
makes a life transformative is faith in what Jesus has done and then aligning your life to his. Jesus says, the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush everyone on whom it falls. So it is of huge importance that people get how important it is to align their lives to Jesus. Because when you don't align your life to the mercy and compassion of God, when you start trying to earn your salvation yourself by the good things you're doing, instead of let the good that you're doing flow out of your thankfulness and gratefulness to God, when you try and do it yourself, this truth is going to crush you and all that you've hoped to accomplish. It's really helpful, important, essential to get this. And it's quite complicated, right? It's hard to get our minds around this because it involves so many pieces. Acts says, uh, Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. So Acts quotes uh, this verse and has become the cornerstone. Jesus is the one who's the cornerstone. There's salvation in no one else. So anyone who gets to heaven is going to get there because of Jesus. There's salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven among mortals by whom we must be saved. We have been for longer than I can remember. I don't remember how long it's been, but a long time going through the Bible, one chapter a week, uh, and f in, within that chapter fo focusing on one or two key verses and just working our way. We worked our way through uh, Mark and through Luke, through Acts. W w recently we've been going through Romans. And as we've been marching along, when we got to Romans 8, I thought, well, we really could camp here for a while. That Romans 8 is so filled with so many great verses. Even if you can't understand the whole argument, you can look at individual verses and be blessed by so many key concepts in Romans 8. And I thought, wow, it'd sure be nice to stop here. We got to Romans 9, and uh, um, in ancient Israel, when, when the nation of Israel was being led by God, eventually they, they rejected the promised land, so they had to be in the wilderness for a while. And God led them by a pillar of cloud in the, in the daytime and at night, uh, they could see light, fire, um, and, and wherever that cloud went, that's where they camped. And sometimes they camped for a long time, sometimes they were on the move. I felt last week like instead of continuing to march along one chapter a week, we're supposed to camp here for a while, a month. So this is our second week of camping on these verses. It's a concept that God started to bring out in, uh, in our assembly uh, several weeks before, three weeks before Easter. We had three independent members come up to the microphone and say, here's something I think God's trying to say to us. Two members and one member who came to me privately, each with the same message. Um, that this message, that there's salvation in no one but Jesus, is true and, and it's, it's imperative for us to start letting people know God's amazing mercy and compassion and goodness for them. Uh, that, that this is something that we're all called to be saying. Now we all know that, right? That's, I mean, that's the Great Commission, it's the central message. We talk about it over the course of a year uh, regularly because it's so central to Jesus' mission. Uh, but, but I'm pretty, uh, I believe that this is something God's calling us to camp on, to just spend some time figuring out, okay, how does that work in my life? I know Jesus called me to uh, announce the good news to all nations, to all people everywhere. How do I accomplish that as a 
whatever kind of person you are, as a shy person, as a boisterous person, as a rambunctious, fun-loving person, whatever your personality type, there are people who need to hear from you because they won't listen from your neighbor who can't relate to them. But you can relate to them. So how will you be bringing this amazing message that uh, one of the things that happens to fish this, I'm going to tell you a story, not science. It's a theory that fish can't really tell too much about the ocean because they're just used to it. I don't know if that's true for fish or not, and quite frankly, anybody who tells you that has never spoken to a fish. <laughs> so they're just making it up. But it is true for us that we often get so used to our environment that we don't notice it. And so many people think, well, I don't really have that much to offer anybody around me. And they have no idea the peace that they are taking for granted. The assurance when things start to fall apart, that God, that God has their back, that God holds them in the palm of their hand. The assurance that they have, they have no idea what it feels like to live without that insurance. To, to be separate from the knowledge of God's amazing mercy. And so there are many things that, that we think, well, that's, uh, everybody should know that, but people don't. And so uh, how will we connect with what God is longing to get out to people who do not yet know the good news? You think, well, everybody should know in this, this day and age about God and Jesus. Um, I uh, know a guy who is a uh, half owner of a laundromat. On Saturday morning, he got, yesterday, he got a call from someone who was at the laundry at 6.15. Now this particular laundromat, um, the doors automatically open at 6. So there's nobody there, the doors just unlock, and people who want to do their laundry can show up. So here's uh, someone who showed up, there's no, nobody officially there. Uh, but she's got her laundry, she's put her laundry in the washer, she's put the money in the machine, and it's starting to go around, and there's no water in there, it's broken. And she's wasting her money, because the, so she calls the owner, and he told me, I should have checked the closed circuit television, but I was just too sleepy. So I went down. Well, there's really no water that's supposed to be in the dryers. <laughs> and if you put your clothes in the dryer expecting them to be washed, they will go around and around, just like some washers go around that direction, uh, but no water's going to flow in there. And when I first heard that, I thought, so was she... Uh, uh, had she been drinking? She had not been drinking, and so my second guess was, well, she's never been to a laundromat before, but she had told him, uh, well, everyone puts their washers right by the entrance. What are the dryers doing here? <laughs> so she had been to laundromats before. Uh, so my third guess, uh, obviously I'm not good at guessing, what how could this have happened? Uh, but my third guess is she needs glasses and she's too vain and it would be like me walking around and I, I, you know, I could put money in a lot of things and be mistaken if I didn't wear my glasses. So I, I, maybe that's not it for her, maybe she was sleepy, I don't know. What she had was a theory. The world always acts the same way. Always, in every laundromat I've been in, you go in the door and there are the washers. So since I've gone in the door, this machine right here has to be a washer. There are people in the world who are trying to get their clothes washed, standing in front of a dryer, putting, machine, putting money in it not able to figure out why it isn't working. 
and they can't figure it out. They've done what they know to be true. They've taken their laundry to the right spot, they've put their clothes in, they've put the money in, and it's just not working. And it's only someone who knows a different reality who can come up to them and help them realize that Jesus is the only way to salvation. And their clothes can be washed. They can be at peace. They can receive the gift of God's Spirit anytime they ask. They can align themselves to Jesus and it will feel weird because Jesus is at a different angle than everything else. And when you align yourself to Jesus, you're going to be at a different angle than everything else, but you're going to be aligned with righteousness and justice. So when you see things in the environment that are out of alignment with righteousness and justice, you'll know it because it'll be out of align with you since you're aligned to Jesus. And you'll be m much more inclined to do something about it. Now I know there are lots of people who look at litter on our lawn and just walk by. Or walk by saying, huh, someone should do something about that. So just because you're aligned with Jesus doesn't mean that you'll actually do something about righteousness and justice, but you'll have an opportunity to see where the world needs help. Where there are people who, uh, who desperately need your intervention. Often in a very simple way. There's salvation in no one else act says, there's no other name under heaven under mor among mortals by which we must be saved. We're gonna take a moment for prayer. God, uh, there's so many things that are true, but unless you help us, we'll never have eyes to see it. We'll maybe even believe that it's true, but just not follow through. After aligning ourselves with the truth, even we can still not follow through and take steps that reflect the way that we're lined up with your truth and with Jesus. But we ask that you help us like living stones to be active and doing your work so that your kingdom comes to the world that so desperately needs it. Thank you for your mercy for us. And thank you for your amazing mercy for people who don't not yet know of your love. Open their eyes and their hearts. Thank you. Amen.